Um, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the previous um, speakers and very thought-provoking presentations. Uh, it's my pleasure to be invited along <coughs> with such distingu di distinguished speakers. And like Professor uh, Alden just pointed out, what I want to say has largely been, been said. But uh, I do like to offer some of my sort of own experiences working as ODI fellow uh, in Nigerian presidency over the last two years to you, and, and as well as offering my take on the realities and unanswered questions uh, in the China-Africa relationship. So um, I worked as ODI fellow in the Nigerian presidency uh, between 2000 and 2012. I, I became a very interesting phenomenon in my office because I became the Chinese Aoibo, if you like, the Chinese white man uh, working in the Nigerian presidency. At first, there were lots of suspicions because people thought I was a spy or et cetera, et cetera, what a Chinese person is doing in our presidency. But it was an interesting experience because I, I, I was, if you like, in a, in a very small image, the China in Africa um, from that perspective. And my office was, was in charge of a sort of public service delivery function in the Nigerian government. We had a large budget to deliver public services um, to attain the Millennium Development Goals in Nigeria. And uh, I, it was a great experience in terms of me interacting with my African colleagues. Sorry, why the slides are going? Um, yeah. And, and I got on really well with them. And one of them even gave me a Hausa name called me Sheikh Usman, which apparently meant the Islamic scholar. Um, so those are the, some of the images that me working with, uh, with uh, Nigerian professors. And also the picture on the right was um, when my office uh, received the deputy Chinese ambassador. And it was really that moment I realized how little uh, Nigerian officials knew about China and also Chinese engagement uh, in Africa. Indeed, to speak about misconceptions, uh, I have something sort of personal anecdotes to offer to you. Uh, when I was there, um, Chinese com com companies often came to me and asked me if I could award them with lucrative government contracts because I work for the Nigerian government, which definitely turns out to be a misconception indeed. Mm -hmm. But what is interesting, I'd like to say here, is that it is a reflection, it is a quite accurate reflection of sort of Chinese business mentality when they are facing with, facing with China, uh, government officials either in China or outside of China. And then there were two other interesting stories. There was once that a Chinese company that has op been operating for more than 30 years in Africa came to me to ask me if I could help them to fast track um, the payment of, uh, into their projects in a northern Nigerian state. But uh, unfortunately, that was really outside my sphere of influence. And, and my favorite one was, 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 was this time when a, a representative of a large uh, Chinese firm who, um, who apparently lost a significant, significant sum of money when they, uh, due to the change of government in Nigeria. And the poor guy was told by his headquarters in Beijing that he has to stay in Nigeria until he can recover the money. So, well, well, so I interestingly, these stories do illustrate sort of people's misconception of my ability as ODI fellow working in Nigerian government, but they also underscore the challenging business environment facing uh, Chinese enterprises in, in Africa. China-Nigeria uh, economic and trade relationship is a very honky-dory uh, story. And according to the latest data, the bilateral uh, trade, trade value has almost doubled um, since 2010 since 2010. And if we put, in, put this into sort of bigger picture story, um, we can see that, like Professor uh, Fu has pointed out earlier, the economic picture is, 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 is changing rapidly, and the trade relationship is, is also changing rapidly. The interesting point I'd like to point out from this graph is that China is running, as you can see from 2008 onwards, a trade deficit with Africa, mostly due to its resource appetite. And if we also apply, um, if we also want to look at the distribution of China's direct investment, foreign direct investment in Africa, we have the breakdown such as this. Yes, resources and mining sector domin uh, is, is, uh, uh, occupies the lion's share of the pie, but also in finance, building industry, manufacturing are also very significant. And all these data are from the Chinese government white paper on China-Africa of trade and economic relations released in August 2013. So the economic relationship is doing is between China and Africa is doing really well. And for oh sorry, this slide is going again. Previous. So for people in development, what is really close to my heart 
is what lessons can China offer to Africa in terms of structural transformation, job creation, and poverty reduction? Yes, indeed, uh, special economic zones has been tried by Western countries, uh, previously in West Africa, uh, in, in, in Africa. But I do think there is probably some lessons we can, we can take from the East Asian experience in, in the functioning of the zones. And, and there are lots of rationales for, for special economic zones, indeed. And they can, be, they can serve as centers of uh, job creation, technology tra transfer, et cetera, et cetera. But very importantly, I think it pro for, for, from a policy angle, it, pr provides a very, um, it provides an economic laboratory in which you can use it as a pilot scheme and limit the political and business risk within it, which can be very co attractive to policymakers. And this is special economic zone in China. This is the Shanghai Pudong special economic zone. And the picture above gives you the zone in early 80s, where it's literally barren land. And in 2003, this is what you see. If we take a moment to pause on that, we, uh, the, the story there is that it can work, and it can work very well. And those are precisely the images that Chinese uh, African leaders are seeing when they go to China. And, uh, and, they want to, and this is why, precisely, they want to learn from the so-called success stories on SEZ in China. And I, when I was uh, working in Nigeria, I had the pleasure uh, to, to visit one of the SEZ in, uh, in Lekki Free Zone uh, in Lagos, Nigeria. It is a wonderful site. It's really um, uh, strategically located next to the most populous city in Africa, only 50 kilometers away from Lagos City. And, um, and also, it, ha it, will, it will have a seaport and international airport. And all the business in incentives are, are very well presented on paper. And guess what happened? The, the zone was, in, was incepted in 2006, and up to now, those are, uh, th those are the, the, the biggest sort of progress you can see in terms of development of zones. And indeed, there are lots of challenges on, on why those uh, special economic zones uh, in Africa don't work. Um, and according to the latest study by the World Bank in 2010, and there indeed a lack of there are lots of challenges for, for the lucky free zone. And the most important one being there's a lack of shared management experience in, in those zones. Because often in these zones, you will have a Chinese, Chinese counterpart and a Nigeria rep represented in the management structure. And it's often not very clear who's in charge, who is going to call the final shot. And that is proved to be very difficult in the functioning of the zones. And also, other factors such as um, lack of definitive goals, performance in indicators, concrete timetables um, on, on based on market and demand analysis are also um, lacking. All of these challenges do propose interesting questions for, for researchers. And the key question, obviously, is that given SEZ have worked in China, what lessons can they offer for Africa? And within this bigger, bigger picture question, we can also ask, how does a sort of state firm relations affect investment decisions in this SEZ? Is the necessary, is the state involvement, the state involvement in, chi in China's overseas SEZ a blessing or impediment to, 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 to the development of th those zones? And are there privately funded zones which have functioned better? And also interesting, we can also ask, are there non-Chinese special economic zones which has worked better in Africa? And, and also, the next question seems to be a cliche. Uh, what, how can the role of the host government help to explain the sex success or failures of these zones? And also, uh, also next, we can also ask, how does Ch Chinese FDI differ from other existing and previous FDI to Africa in terms of facilitating transfer of managerial expertise and, and technology? And, and nowadays, everybody is talk, talking about the BRICS. We can also ask questions such as, how do the BRICS um, invest in developing countries. I think those zones offers a very good uh, window <coughs> into such research questions, and uh, and and questions such as how do the BRICS view risks differently um, from other um, OECD countries when they invest in Africa is also another question we we can uh, explore further. Thank you very much.